Thanks, Ben, and uh, thanks for inviting me here. And I really like that you have a center that combines conservation and, and development. Um, I don't know whether that's unique in the US, but it's, it's certainly fairly rare and really good to have those, those two uh, different orientations and emphases put together in the same school because of course they're interconnected. And I think because of the nature of the school, um, I was kind of inspired to, to, to revisit some work that I did uh, with one of my students and aware that many students come into conservation and development with an interest in one or other disciplines and find themselves having to transition and incorporate others. I thought I would give an example from um, the work of one of my students, Sharon Brooks, um, that I did with a team of us from different disciplines uh, some years ago in uh, Thomas Sap in Cambodia. And the other reason for choosing this was that I looked at the sort of animals involved and thought, Florida. <laughs> <laughs> And of course, you're, you have gators, that's, that's, a, that's a Siamese crocodile, but close enough to those of us who are not reptile specialists. Um, so I want to talk about snakes, crocodiles, and markets, and, and much else besides. But really, the focus is on uh, talking about interdisciplinary approaches to conservation, how really a case study of interdisciplinary conservation science um, can support or inform management decision making and really perhaps just to um, get conversations going with some of you who are also mixing these these approaches and i'm going to talk about really four interconnected systems that find their point of intersection geographically in the tonle sap in cambodia um, i know some of you kai others uh, have been been there and worked there has anyone else worked there Okay. So, um, it's a almost like a, a sort of aquatic lung of the Mekong River. The Mekong River flows down here uh, into the sea there, and in the flood season, um, this flow backs up and fills the Tonlesap floodplain. This shaded area is the extent of the lake in the wet season, and that's normally co covered in a mix of forests and grasslands. And, and the lake swells to cover this area and then shrinks back and the, and the Tonle Sap River reverses its flow and then flows down into the Mekong. So this is a river that flows in two directions according to the season. And this is a classic sort of flood pulse system um, and the ecology is driven by that, very seasonal uh, livelihood strategies. So the system that we're looking at incorporates natural resource and the ecological system, um, a commodity chain analysis that links snakes and crocodiles, and a livelihood system analysis that looks at what people in this floodplain system do with this highly fluctuating environment and the diversity of resources that are available to them. And it looks at the institutions that govern this kind of system. I haven't talked very much about this in this talk, partly through lack of time and partly because when we did this, we it was very exploratory and we didn't go into uh, the institutional aspects as deeply as perhaps we should have done. And the analysis also encompasses multiple scales as um, most conservation issues have to. Uh, it looks at local livelihood systems, national legislation, regional trade, and to some extent global legislation as well. Um, the work actually took place quite some time ago and I was looking recently to see what had happened since, and the answer was very little, at least in the published literature, that I could find. So the research was initially inspired by um, some word we got back via yeah, the Wildlife Conservation Society in Cambodia, who said that there was this big snake harvest going on, and this was looked at in a descriptive way um, by some of their wildlife biologists and it became an issue of concern and I had a student uh, who was a herpetologist by training who wanted to work on this system and so she began to work with us on this and we set ourselves really the objectives of trying to find out 
some basic information about the system from a conservation management point of view. So is this huge harvest an estimated 7 million snakes removed per annum um, from seven different species? Is it ecologically sustainable? What do we know about the people who are catching, processing and trading these snakes? At the time, very little. Um, where are the markets? What's happening to these snakes? Who's buying them? Where are they ending up? Um, who's making money out of this? So what does the, what's the structure of the value chain look like? Um, who depends on them for, for livelihoods? So where does it fit into the livelihood system? Does that harvest need to be managed, and, and if so, how? Um, and how can you govern in a meaningful way this complex linked ecology livelihood trade system? So those are the sort of outline research questions that drove um, the project that we set out to do. And it became evident early on that snake hunting is an important livelihood activity um, for the rural poor living around Tonlesat. Um, snake hunters, <coughs> or snake fishers, or snakers, or whatever term you want to use for them, uh, use gill nets to catch snakes in the flooded forests during the flood season. And snakes are targeted during the time of year when fish abundance is low. So they end up forming a, a sort of crucial part of seasonal um, patterns of resource use. And in essence, these markets, which were evolving at the time we were doing the research, were largely the, the biggest source of most of these snakes was the crocodile farming industry, which was booming from the 1980s, um, which provided the new opportunities for tonless sap fishers to supply snakes as crocodile food. Um, and the Wildlife Conservation Society and others had raised these concerns that levels of exploitation were unsustainable and concerns for the sort of future sustainability level of the whole system uh, were being raised. And there was also a sense that the fishers... Frank, yeah. So you're saying then that the snakes was not the fault of the kind of subsistence system. So it first became a problem. There was a certain level of subsistence catching of snakes, but it was not a targeted industry um, to the extent, and you'll see some of the pictures that indicate the scale of it. And it was the kind of thing that if you caught a snake, you might take it home and eat it. The same way that many people who have rice paddies that catch snakes and frogs and things like that they come across them. Uh, but this is a sort of directed large scale, uh, large scale hunt. And so there was a concern that because the fishers, who were the people who were catching the snakes as well, were poorly connected to, um, to regional markets, there were concerns that they might not get you know, a fair um, price. And that might in turn drive them to, to fish more intensively to try and, and make some revenue from this. So that the flooded forest um, during the wet season on this up looks like this. Um, and the, the gill nets are set among the trees in, in the passages of the water between them. And the, the lake level goes up, um, I think it's about six or seven meters. So it's quite a big fluctuation, huge volumes of water. And these are busy places. There are floating villages where people's lives um, trading systems, etc., take place almost entirely on water. And people live in, in mobile or semi-mobile houseboats and uh, typically have a small vessel that they use to sort of connect with the resources from that. And what you see here is actually a cage with crocodiles in it. Um, kids playing on it, etc. <laughs> and so what we did in terms of trying to get a handle on this system was, first of all, for the ecological system, a decision was made to focus on the snake species because there's very little known about their biology and taking on the entire system ecology was, was too big a thing. Um, but also to, to think about 
fisheries and the lake and floodplain ecology as you know, part of the system that livelihoods were based on. So we had to know something about the functioning and ecosystem, but we sort of placed the boundaries of our study around largely the snake um, population biology, population ecology. Uh, in terms of the trading system, we looked at uh, who the actors were, um, we followed prices, and we looked at the structure of, of markets. And for the livelihood system, we, looked, we did household economic surveys, we looked at seasonality, and we looked at factors that made livelihoods vulnerable. And the governance system, we didn't look into as closely as we, we might have done, but we looked at regulatory frameworks, some of local customs and social norms, um, formal management systems, and international trade regulations, uh, like CITES and so on. So to look at the snakes, um, we instituted a catch sampling program and looked at population dynamics to construct models of potential effects of harvesting at different levels, different sizes of snakes and so on, using kind of fairly standard fishery science techniques for stocks where you have very limited amount of, of information. Um, so that involved Sharon, who loved snakes and mm -hmm. found this a really hard job dealing with this number of dead snakes. Mm -hmm. um, doing essentially a, a sort of length frequency analysis, it was hard to age these things, but looking at, uh, at the length structure of the population and age, sex, and maturity, we were able to use length-based population models um, to estimate potential uh, harvesting rates. And that's one of the largest species uh, caught in a gill net there alongside, uh, you can see a couple of fish in there as well. Um, so we did uh, what's called a yield per recruit analysis that looks at um, estimated current levels of uh, fishing mortality and different ages at first capture derived from length frequency analysis and examines where the current um, yield per recruit is in relation to potential maxima. And in general, uh, it was found that, that uh, one of the, the big species, Enhydrus, is fully or over <coughs> exploited, but the other ones are potentially you know, sustainably harvested from a point of view of we also did biomass, um, spawning stock biomass per recruit analysis. And the main conservation concern really was for the larger, more valuable snakes, uh, including some endangered species. There's the seven um, sort of specialist water snakes, but also a number of other snakes in the flood plain that were caught incidentally, uh, some of those sort of valuable and endangered species. And the Siamese crocodile, which was being held captive in those, change, in those cages by um, people living on the lake, is actually IUCN red listed. Uh, but the captive ones, to complicate matters, may be hybrids with Cuban crocodiles. So it's not quite clear what their sort of conservation status is because of that. Um, we felt that understanding the trade system was important as a potential entry point for conservation because, um, for a number of reasons, but knowing something about the value chain meant that there were potential points for intervention in terms of management there. Because regulation on the lake, this large complex, um, you know, not very well uh, surveyed system, was likely to be very difficult to intervene with all these sort of millions of individual actors. But if we understood something about the value chain, we may be able to locate areas um, where conservation management might be, might be possible. Um, in general, small-scale rural markets are characterized by low competition, unequal share of market power, um, whereby poor producers receive unfavorable prices. And resource scarcity might, however, strengthen the position of producers uh, through increasing the competition between traders to get access to the snake stocks. And by studying this, we felt that this had, had sort of broader applicability in the context of um, understanding how wildlife markets and fishery resource markets work in developing countries. And as I said, this might allow us to locate interventions to improve markets for the poor 
um, targeting trade inefficiencies, but also looking at potential conservation um, entry points. So for the trade study, we looked at um, price data from a number of, of landing sites um, and at the hunting sites themselves. So this involves sort of paddling out onto the lake finding out where people were harvesting snakes and following traders that followed the snake hunters out onto the lake. So you had those <laughs> kinds of traders. You also had traders that were at the landing um, sites and we also had information on how many snakes were being eaten um, by the crocodile farms uh, that surrounded the lake or at least a sampling of them. So we had kind of three <coughs> sort of different levels of source information for uh, price data for the snakes. Um, and we conducted a number of interviews with, with both hunters and traders on trading arrangements, networks, prices, um, conditions, interlocking between credit um, markets and, and snake markets. And we worked quite closely with um, a number of both fishing associations and uh, a number of NGOs who were working on conservation issues in the lake. And a lot of the information came through kind of focus group discussions as well as interviews and, um, and surveys. And just a few pictures just to kind of illustrate um, the, the, the value chain. So um, the snake hunters were both men and women, also some, some um, younger people, children, adolescents. And the uh, middlemen um, were buying snakes from hunters out on the lake. So they would sort of paddle out and encounter, this is a, a hunting boat, <coughs> some traders, and, and then negotiating the price while out on the lake and transferring to the trading boat that then lands into uh, one of the the shoreside trading areas that then sells to the crocodile farmers. And so the middlemen then unload the, the fish, uh, snakes actually, to sell to crocodile food traders um, at the lake shore. And so early in the morning, you see these kind of big boxes of, of snakes coming in, along with some fish as well. And there's a nice assortment of snakes and harvested from, from Thomas at least seven and hydro species and then a few others kind of mixed in there as well. Um, so crocodile feed is, is the main market but there are others so here's some snake jerky uh, for sale in local snack markets and there are also markets for, for skins in the larger species and that's uh, my former colleague John Reynolds who's now at uh, Simon Fraser University in, in Canada, um, who's an evolutionary biologist and um, a keen herpetologist, bird watcher, etc. So the snake trade then links to the crocodile trade. And this is someone's uh, back porch. You can see their little porch swing there, um, house in the background, and these little um, sort of concrete cages with a lid, and inside those are baby crocodiles. And it's these baby crocodiles that are sold then to Thailand and ungrown for meat and skins. So that's the kind of end of the, end of the, the value chain. And what's normally kept um, also in the backyard are uh, <laughs> the brood stocks. And so, I don't know, this may be a normal site in the backyards of suburban <laughs> Gainesville. Um, this is suburban Siem Reap where it was a surprisingly normal site. A large number of kind of wealthy middle class civil servants, people who work for fisheries department, business people who in their backyard have a um, crocodile breeding program going essentially. And this is, this is where the snakes land. Um, and visiting these places has its own hazards. Um, I'm not sure health and safety would clear that necessarily, but yeah, you're in the middle of suburban Kenya. And I even stayed in a guest house that had a crocodile farm in the backyard. Those kind of perhaps who don't pay their bills. <laughs> terror. 
So this is what the trade network looked like from our, our research. Uh, you had the hunters and fishers out on the lake and about half of what they caught um, was sold to traders and collectors that went out into the forest to find them. And the other half to uh, village-based traders. And the forest-based traders then sold to the village-based traders in most cases and sometimes directly to land-based crocodile food traders. Um, and you also had these sort of people buying the larger snakes. And the large snake traders were in the skin trade, essentially the snake skin trade, and the live snakes, some of them sold for pets or various others, um, sold on to an export trader. And then at that point, we kind of lost track of it. Um, in the crocodile food market, some went to market seller who, who then took them to crocodile farms. Some of it went um, for snack food, uh, a small amount of it, presumably higher margins on that, um, and eventually to human consumption. And so that's kind of what the, the trade network looked like. Up to six transactions can take place between hunting and uh, ultimate consumption by people or crocodiles. And looking at um, price over, we managed to get um, parts of three to four year um, hunting seasons, variations in price, uh, starts high, drops, and then rises again, and basically inversely related to, to the quantity available. And looking at the sort of price at, at the different levels, and looking at price transmission across the value chain, this is a paper that was published in Journal of Development Studies, um, really what it indicated was that intermediary traders as you know, the so-called exploitative middlemen were not usually um, exploitative. They, they in fact play an incredibly important role in the Tonle Sap snake trade by being able to get these snakes to market. Um, because if you're out on the lake hunting and you have to bring them in too short to sell direct to traders, it's not profitable to keep you know, going way out to these distant grounds all the time. So having someone come to collect and act as an intermediary is really important. And they also extended credit for gear and all kinds of other functions as well. Um, so these intermediaries were a, were a sort of necessary part of this, this value chain system. And you know, their purchasing and trying to sell on to crocodile farmers also incurs some risks. So they take on some of the, the, the business risks in these transactions as well. <coughs> Um, what we didn't manage to find out a great deal about were the powerful traders at the top of the supply chains, the crocodile farm owners uh, in Cambodia and Thailand, and the global skin trade traders. And the sense was that the market was being controlled by these people, but they were very reluctant to, uh, to talk to us. Um, so the snakes are just part of a diverse natural resource system. There's a whole range of, of sort of products and trades associated with Tonle Sap, of which the snake uh, trading is, is and harvesting is just a small seasonal part. And we use the kind of livelihoods um, analysis to look more closely, <laughs> not just at um, you know, people's activities, what they, what they were doing, um, but what that led to in terms of you know, relative levels of, of poverty, whether you could associate certain kinds of livelihoods access to certain kinds of opportunities with different levels of poverty um, and wealth, and what assets uh, you needed and what kind of policies and institutions and processes, including markets and market access, um, how those mediated your ability to use your assets um, to secure your, your livelihoods. And this work was done with a combination of household microeconomic surveys, focus group discussions, and, and key informant interviews. Um, a small sample, because this is quite detailed work, um, but uh, 155 households in contrast to the really sort of large-scale surveys that um, development organizations typically undertake to determine poverty levels and so on. This was much more uh, sort of in-depth, um, really to learn as much as possible about um, where snakes fitted in to people's livelihoods. So I mentioned there's a diversity of livelihoods, there's diversity even within each of those livelihood systems. So just taking fishing, 
enormous range of, of diverse methods from these sort of lift net platforms to cast nets, um, trap fishing, uh, little baited pots uh, for freshwater shrimp, largely. And a whole range of harvesting activities. These are uh, water lily stems. And those are earthworms. Um, so every kind of part of this resource system really finds, finds a use and, and a market. And uh, just some, some other ones, rats, um, snails, and those are deep fried tarantulas. Mm -hmm. This is for a food market. This is probably for crocodile feed as well. Um, this is also for human consumption. And, you know, elephants for a whole range of, of sort of agricultural um, uses and transportation and so on. Floating gardens um, and lots of associated trades from fish trading in markets to selling gear um, and making bricks from sediments, weaving firewood collection from the flooded forest. So there's a tremendous range of complex activities going on and sort of sorting out who has access to what under what conditions is a kind of major part of the, of the research challenge and, and figuring out which activities are associated with higher incomes and uh, which with lower. And it turns out that, that snake harvesting tends to be the activity of, among the poorest people who don't have access to these kind of higher value livelihoods that necessitate access to land or to you know, particular kinds of markets. Um, and then you have all the service industries that are, that are sort of based on the natural resource-based activities. So out on Tonle Sap, this is a mobile um, lunch, noodle and rice store that calls in at your, your houseboat. Um, so the research showed that snakes were seasonally important in livelihoods, particularly for the poorer groups. And I've skated over a lot of the results here just to give you the sort of general sense of what was going on, but I'll give you a list of the papers for people who want to sort of follow that in more depth. And it turns out that the sort of period of highest livelihood um, importance in the flood season uh, is also the time that the snakes breed. So you know, there's, there's, there's a vulnerability of the snakes at that time to capture and um, the quantity that are caught are, uh, it's good from the crocodile feed point of view, they're all gravid, they're, they're, they're at their most nutritious, so they're the best crocodile food. And talking to traders and looking at, at prices, the price of snakes was often slightly higher than the price of fish. And there's a general sense that snakes make the best crocodile feed. They need better condition than the crocodiles, better, better skins, better, better sort of breeding, etc., than, than the fish. So many people felt that these were a preferred food for, for crocodiles. Um, but a very, if you look at the, in income terms, the amount of annual income from the snakes is a relatively small fraction. In, in most cases. Um, between 10 and 20% of annual income came from the snake harvest. But it was the timing of that income. Um, if you did not have um, farmland and you were dependent entirely on the forest system and the fisheries, this was the low season for fishing and this was the time when snakes were most beneficial. Um, so overall what we found was that snakes were heavily exploited, um, but some were within sustainable exploitation limits. And that part of the advice I think, seems to have sort of slipped out of the, the kind of conservation discussion literature that was, that was based on these findings. I think the sheer numbers of snakes and, and, and the sort of visual impact meant that rather sort of alarmist views of imminent collapse were the prevalent discussion in the, in the conservation community and the kind of, you know, all that snake measuring and, and modeling really didn't have that much of an impact in terms of, of, of people's sort of policy responses. Um, the trading system on Tonle Sap we felt was locally equitable and, and efficient, um, but markets were controlled by crocodile farmers and snakeskin traders, and you know, ultimately the price is fixed by, by them, and they're the ones that have access to the international market.
Um, snakes contribute to household income and food security at, at this critical time of year when fish catches are low. Um, and we searched and found very little, if any, either formal or informal conservation actions specific to snakes. They seem to fall between fishery rules, so fishery rules applied to fish, wildlife rules applied to other kinds of wildlife, and snakes were sort of nowhere to be seen in either. So there was a sort of legislative vacuum, really, um, into which this trade had developed. And we see this quite often, I think, new trades arise and then legislation seems to have to catch up. And sometimes you, you have to have this enormous boom before anyone even notices that there's an issue that might need some kind of regulation. So regulation is always trying to catch up. Um, and that's, I think, a, a recurrent problem in conservation. So the questions that we're left with, and, and if there's any students looking for interesting projects, um, these are the kinds of things I think that would, that would make interesting follow-ups. And I've checked the literature and couldn't really find very much on what has happened since, other than lots of videos and things about the snake harvest and, and lots of alarmist articles in the likes of the Discovery Channel and National Geographic and TV stations around the world. Steve Irwin went there and caught some of these snakes. Um, but we don't know what's happened to the snake harvest. There's been no continual monitoring of it since the study that we did. Um, the options for reducing hunting pressure on snakes if conservation action is indeed need, needed um, haven't been really looked at in ways that could also support livelihoods. Uh, <coughs> what kind of governance system would work that hasn't been looked at and um, you know, where in the system could you most easily intervene to try to uh, maintain um, sustainable harvests? Again, these, are, these remain, as far as I know, open questions. And so this was, this was our um, very exploratory foray into uh, a new and unknown wildlife trade system. And it attracted interest regionally amongst particularly uh, herpetologists also those working on, on Tomlis Sap. A lot of work has gone on since on the fisheries, and the snake, har snake harvest has sort of been incorporated somewhat into that work, um, but not fully, and it remains a very understudied uh, conservation system. And as I said, this was largely the work of Sharon Brooks, who's now at the World Conservation Monitoring um, Center, and her interdisciplinary training paid off. As I said, she started as a herpetologist, and um, she's now in charge of the Biodiversity and Business Initiative at WCMC. Um, Berika Kebede is an agricultural economist who works with us on the sort of trade aspects of this. John Reynolds, herpetologist, conservation biologist, did most of the sort of ecological inputs. Um, Jenny Gill, another biologist, and, and I sort of worked on, on the livelihood systems stuff. Um, Supported by Wildlife Conservation Society in Cambodia and Osmos, a very active local NGO. Um, interdisciplinary research funding. I don't know if NSF has these interdisciplinary programs here. And thanks to um, the institutes here um, for supporting my visit to come and tell you a little bit about this strange and quirky trade <laughs> and livelihood system on the south. And there's some follow-up reading for those who kind of want to know a little bit more. Thanks.